Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. In this podcast, we are going to interview researchers from Pulse Academia and Industry about their work, thoughts, spectrum, and more beyond that. This is Marwa Edwini, and I hope you will find this podcast useful. If you would like to connect with us, simply send us, and we will be happy to hear from you. And here is my interview. Thanks. Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. Uh, hello, Professor Holt. Thanks so much for joining us in the podcast. I would like to ask you first how you would like to define yourself for the audience for the first time listening to you. Uh, it was a, first, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and an honor. Uh, I would uh, probably call myself a roboticist. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of my uh, research has been always around uh, robotics, uh, and I look at different angles of robotics from the body to the brain, the AI, the morphology, the materials, any way you look at it. But it's, it's mm -hmm. all, always been about robotics for me. Yeah, wonderful. So I would like to go back for your childhood. Did you have any memories of your childhood interesting in science technology? I saw one interview were interested about aliens, but if you can tell us how we were childhood. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, well, you know, from my childhood, probably I was always uh, interested in building things. So um, I never, uh, I wasn't uh, one of those that would take things apart to understand how they work. I think at, at, uh, at my core, I'm, I'm more of an engineer than a scientist. I'm really interested in making things mm. and making things that are new and making things that are challenging. Uh, really nothing motivates me more than somebody saying that it's not possible to make this or that then. Uh, so I'm always trying to do that. And it's not a coincidence, uh, you know, that I'm interested in robotics because I think one of the biggest challenges uh, for engineers is to make uh, really to make machines that are uh, not unlike humans to sort mm -hmm. of to recreate ourselves. That's maybe one of the biggest uh, challenges. And in doing so, we learn more about being human, but we also, uh, I think, from a practical point of view, can create uh, one of the biggest accomplishes, um, accomplishments of nature. And so uh, so that's what I've been after always. Yeah. And as a kid, it, it always started with making things. Wonderful, yeah. So I'm curious to ask you, uh, do you remember what is the first robot you built and what kind of question you had in your mind? Because of course, I think well, you are one of the pioneer to the concept of self-awareness and robots. So, but at this time, what's the kind of question? What's the first robot you built at the time? Yeah, so I've always been interested in this, in this uh, uh, question of creativity, mm. uh, I have to say. And, and, and that, that touches a little bit on not necessarily a physical robot, but it's more of, of, you know, can you make a machine that can design another machine? Mm -hmm. um, uh, can you make a robot that can design and build another robot? So it starts with things like, um, uh, like, uh, mm. you know, like, like design automation and things like that. But, uh, and then you connect that with 3D printers and so on. Uh, and really the quest is to make uh machines that can uh, can design and build other machines from the ground up. And to, my first robot really uh, mm -hmm. was uh, an evolved robot, a robot that was a product not of my hand design, but a product of, of an evolutionary process, a simulated evolutionary process that put together lots of robot parts and let them compete with each other. And the best, ro best robots got to uh, jump into reality through mm -hmm. a 3D printer. That was back in 1999, the previous uh, millennium, where 3D yeah. printers were still new and computers were still slow. But we, mm -hmm. uh, together with my advisor at the time, uh, Jordan Pollock, we were able to make some of the first uh, 3D printed robots and certainly the first robot that was designed by another machine. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'm curious to ask you when you spoke about self-aware, uh, designing self-aware robot. First thing, how you, if you can, because you speak a lot that this is, term is really vague for consciousness, right. self-awareness. So from right. robotics, how you can give us concrete maybe definitions for these terms, which is really still we don't understand so much well. Self-awareness is a fascinating topic to me. For me, it's it's one of one of these uh, maybe miracles almost. It's one of these grand challenges. One of these things that are uh, 
on on par with uh, with with life's big questions like the origin of, of the universe and the origin of life and so on uh, the question is what is self-awareness this thing that we know that we have as humans we all think about ourselves and we're aware of ourselves we know it's pretty much unique to to humans certainly at the level that we experience it uh, and so, and what is it? And that's, you know, that question that you just asked, define self-awareness. That's something that's, that humans have been, and philosophers really, religious people, engineers, neuroscientists, a lot of different people have been trying to define that for, for thousands of years. What is it that makes us unique? What is that? Is it a soul? What, you know, what is that thing that makes us human? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so as a roboticist, when you come to this question, you have to step away from some of that philosophy and religion and try to define it in a way that you can actually build it. And this is a very, very different mindset. And so my definition of self-awareness is really, it's a very pragmatic definition. It's the ability to self-simulate. So mm -hmm. I would argue that everything uh, that when uh, that we humans, we are fantastic at being able to uh, to see ourselves into the future. We can imagine ourselves doing things. We can imagine what it's like to be, you know, what what tomorrow is going to be like. We can imagine what what we're going to smell and feel uh, if we walk on the beach tomorrow. We can think about what it's going to be like to retire. We can imagine ourselves in the future in lots of different timescales and lots of different ways. And that ability to imagine yourself in the future and in the past is self-awareness instead of just living in the moment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and to the degree that machines can simulate themselves in the future and revisit the past rather than just responding and reacting to the moment, that's the degree to which uh, a robot is self-aware. So it's not a black and white thing. It's not, are you self-aware or not? It's really the degree to which you're self-aware. And I think we humans, as we grow older, we become more and more self-aware. We see ourselves in the past, in the future and with, with greater fidelity and, and longer horizon, uh, as opposed to living in a moment. And, uh, and that's what we want machines to have. And, and you, can, you can argue about whether it's a good idea or not for the machines to be self-aware why we want to do it. But, but I think if you're looking for a definition, mm -hmm. that's, that's a definition that I can offer. Yeah, great. So maybe I'm curious you, since you try to um, maybe reflect this concept in robotics, and I think that will be, uh, I think it's changing the perspective how we can design this robot. So for example, you say that missing bees that can robot acquire self simulation or self model, for example. So how do you see this kind of key element, for example, if I have to maybe consider the body in that case or the sensing or the vision, mm -hmm. and do you think it has correlation? For example, also we're thinking about uh, the gold, for example, any animal just born and can walk directly. And this is the, the innate that you can do that. Is this something you think related to self-awareness that you don't know the environment, you're just born and you can walk directly? How does right. Happen? Yeah, so so look, a lot of, uh, you can make a machine that you turn it on and it just walks and it doesn't have any simulation. It's not aware of itself in any fundamental way and it can still walk. And also a horse is born yeah. and it can walk uh, right out. So, so you can program these things in advance, uh, but that's not self-awareness. This is an automaton that, that just uh, executes commands uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and can do it. But in order to walk well in all kinds of unanticipated conditions, you need um, a forward model. And a forward model in kinematics is the ability to, again, to predict where your limbs are gonna move and what is going to be the shape of your body depending on how you actuate various muscles. Mm. And that forward model is a sort of very, very simple self-simulation. It's not going to tell you what you're going to sense uh, in a long-term future. It's not going to tell you uh, what you're going to feel tomorrow, but it's going to tell you what your body, where your body is going to move in the next millisecond, right? Or in the next second. So it's a very short-term, very constrained self-model. And I, and a horse that is born probably does not have that, but after the, the, the horse lives for a few 
weeks and experiences the environment, it begins to form a more accurate self model. And a baby, a human baby, probably, I mean, who knows, but also begins by forming this very simple kinematic self self models. And that is the root of mm -hmm. self awareness. But as humans as animals as we experience more and more our self model becomes more and more and more sophisticated to the point where we humans can imagine what's going to happen a year from now what it's going to feel like uh to i don't know to uh to drive uh to 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 fly in a plane a year from from now what it's going to feel like to to taste something that we haven't tasted before we can imagine ourselves in completely new situations in the long term uh, in in ways that are much more sophisticated than the simple forward model of our body kinematics but at its core it's the same thing it's all about mm -hmm. self-simulation mm -hmm. so maybe the question here how far we are do you think from maybe 100 percent self-aware robot from design do you think so yeah. yeah, so so I think I think we we are approaching this very very fast. So robots today are self aware in a very very crude way. So so there are self there are many robots out there, including our own in our lab, that can simulate themselves uh, from a kinematic point of view. And so, like I said, that's a bit like a horse or an insect, right? So it can sort of see itself in the future, but very short term future and only the kinematic aspects. Uh, but as robots as AI progresses. Um, and artificial intelligence tools allow us to create more and more sophisticated uh, uh, models uh, of self, these models become more and more uh, accurate and they can look more and more into the future. And at least uh, in our lab, we can see robots that can predict what they're going to feel and what they're going to sense and their actions uh, and the actions of things around them, uh, you know, with greater and greater horizons. So again, it's not going to be black and white. It's not going to be, you know, you're going to arrive at some level of consciousness that's going to be, um, um, you know, uh, a, a, you know, it's going to gradually increase over time. It's not, there's no particular threshold. If you ask at what point is it going to be, our machine's going to reach human level self-awareness, which is probably what you're after. That's that's kind of the question that a lot of humans ask. Mm -hmm. um, that's hard to answer, uh, in part because when we are when humans are self-aware, we have different levels of self-awareness at different areas uh, of uh, behavior. We can be self-aware in a particular way when it comes to our own uh, body, but self-aware in a different level when it comes to our let's say social interactions with other people uh, or when it comes to our children. Uh, and uh, robots obviously have very different contexts to be self-aware. So it's very difficult to do a one-to-one -one comparison, mm -hmm. but you're already seeing uh, things that are, um, are, are uh, sort of improving exponentially. And I think that you know within a decade or two, we're going to start We'll certainly be able to see robots that exhibit self models that are on par with humans in some in some respects. Maybe not in everything, but in some respects. So I, I think we're it's going to happen in our lifetime at least, mm -hmm. uh, or lifetime of our children for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So maybe I'm I'm curious to ask you about that shape changing. If you have this trouble, for example, especially in soft robots, we now maybe considering shape changing and how we see the self imaging of the robot in that case. If you can tell us the challenges that you can adapt to shape and functionalities for that. Right. So so when it comes to physical robots, I think uh, this is not a coincidence that roboticists uh, that we roboticists have always started with with rigid robots. Robots mm -hmm. are made of rigid components. These are much simpler to simulate and they're simpler to model. And also from a self-modeling system, it's a lot easier to make a self-modeling system that is made of rigid components. The physics are a lot simpler and the dynamics are easier to predict and so on. Mm -hmm. Soft robotics, on the other hand, is a whole different ballgame. It's a completely uh, it's much more difficult to simulate. It's much more difficult to model, even if you do it from, 
equations. And mm -hmm. it's certainly a lot more difficult to model when you do it uh, automatically using self-modeling systems. Um, so I think uh, the, the bar is a lot higher when it comes to soft robotics. And, and, and uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, from an engineering point of view, we have we have a track record of a couple of decades working with rigid robots and soft robotics is a relatively new field. Uh, it's a lot harder, a lot, uh, a lot more uh, challenging, but also a lot more potential. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, curious in this case of the award is the case. Do you think in soft robotics, uh, do you think maybe nonlinearities or unpredicted or uncertain dynamics could be contrib could contribute mm -hmm. in this self awareness behavior? Yeah, so, so uh, the space of possible behaviors when it comes to soft machines in general mm -hmm. is much larger. The design space is much larger. The, the, the behavior is much more complex. The dynamics are more uncertain, as you just said. There's a lot of uncertainty or there's a lot of chaos uh, in the way things uh, behave. Uh, the, the, the behavior is, is frequently not stationary. In other words, the actuators will not behave in the same way every time. They'll behave in, in a slightly different way every time. So, so again, the design space is much more complex. The effect of the environment on the robot is much more pronounced. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, and again, all of these things are both challenges and opportunities. Mm -hmm. They make everything harder, but they also, uh, including modeling becomes more harder. So self-awareness, if you like. Uh, self-simulation becomes more challenging, but the opportunities and the ways in which these robots can behave is much more versatile. And I think that's uh, yet to be explored. Yeah, yeah. So since you have this a lot of expertise in material and also the self awareness just to, to design a robot. So maybe I'm curious to ask you when we see example and that we spoke in the, the podcast many times, how the dead fish can, the example dead fish can swim upstream. And one of the question, how, how we can exploit or maybe figure out what are the beneficial nonlinearities in the structure so that we can have um, this kind of behavior and in this fish. Do you have any kind of idea how is this relationship between the morphology and also the environment and also the brain or self-awareness? How do you see the relationship between them? And if one of them will lose one of them, which one do you think is could be uh, less significant and can make uh, the robot or maybe it's creature that can survive. Okay, well, that's you. You've asked a lot of different questions there. I think I think there are many aspects, right? There's the body, the, there's the control, there's the inter body uh, control interaction, uh, and um, sometimes uh, referred to as morphological computation, uh, and I think that because we as engineers have had a hard time modeling and building soft robots, we haven't yet explored all the opportunities. Uh, it's very difficult to take advantage of all these opportunities when it's difficult for us to even model and understand how soft robots behave and all, everything that's going on there in there. Uh, evolution, on the other hand, is very good at exploiting all these dynamics mm -hmm. uh, of soft systems, um, but evolution takes a long, a long time. And, uh, I think you know if you know we've done quite a lot of work on uh, evolving soft robots, and in large part, it's because designing soft robots is very very difficult. Simulating soft robots has become possible, but designing soft robot is very very difficult. Mm. Uh, analysis is a lot easier than synthesis, and so we've uh, used evolutionary algorithms to try to design soft robots to take advantage of all these things that you described, the, the body, the control, the interaction, the morphological computation that's happening in the body in real time, all these different things take advantage of them uh, in order to explore the space of, of soft robotics more, more effectively. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you think for simulation, because uh, you're one of the developer for uh, Voxel's uh, animation in that case, how do you see the, the simulation tool for soft robotics recently, since we can't capture dynamics very well? Right. There's, 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 look, there's, there's a big gap missing in, in simulation of soft matter, and in particular, not just soft, but, you know, fast moving soft robotic systems, right? So it's not just a, 
a, a sponge that, that deforms, it really uh, deforms in a dynamic way, in a controllable way, and, and possibly moves fast. Um, uh, so large deformations and fast deformations. So there isn't a lot out there to do that. So there's VoxCAD that we, we developed uh, a few years ago. There's uh, VoxCraft, which is a derivative of that that was uh, developed and works on GPUs from University of Vermont. There's Titan, which is a new uh, software uh, that's uh, been recently developed in our lab and is open source. Uh, there are a few... Uh, soft robotics, soft materials additions to other simulators like PhysX, uh, and they work to uh, better and worse, uh, uh, haven't really tested them. So there's growing attention to soft materials, uh, but it's still pretty difficult to simulate. I would say that's an area where there isn't too much out there. There's certainly no sort of commercial validated off the shelf soft material simulators. Uh, maybe maybe another area to mention is biomechanics. So biomechanics uh, simulation of, in particular simulation of tissue, human tissue is an area that's also very relevant to soft robotics. Uh, biomechanics simulators have been used to simulate things from vascular behavior to, uh, you know, heart, uh, cardio uh, dynamics. And so that's another area where there's been quite a lot of uh, soft matter simulation. So there's 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 a lot of stuff happening on the fringe. There's mm -hmm. no mainstream uh, solution yet. And again, I think that's that's been sort of a bottleneck yeah. to a lot of development in in soft robotics. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to see what you think maybe the missing pieces here, or maybe you think what we as a community have to focus on that we can figure out. Uh, um, yeah, well, you know, a, a, to a large extent, it's just a chicken and egg. So there, there hasn't mm -hmm. been a, a large community of soft robotics researcher. There hasn't haven't been a lot of uh, products that involved uh, that required simulation of soft matter, and so therefore the tools are not very developed. But as the community grows, uh, I can certainly see this. There's more and more demand for soft robotics uh, simulation tools. And that demand will, will be satisfied inevitably by new design tools. So I think, uh, I think that's uh, already happening to a large extent. It's happening mostly driven by academia, but at some mm. point uh, it's gonna be picked up uh, by commercial tools as well. Uh, and uh, and we'll, we'll see, uh, and that will sort of catalyze the soft robotics field. Mm -hmm. Great. So I would like to also ask about, I think, uh, also important aspect about your work about designing robots that can repair. And and we spoke, I think, with Professor Sue from Harvard that designing soft material or soft robot that should be fatigue resistant. In that case, you speak about how you can design robots that can also have so certain redundancy. If damage happening, they can still functioning in that case. How do you see this in soft robotics? If there is damages happening or kind of example like that, do you think we're still missing that in our research? That's redundancy. Yes, I think I think there's a lot. The, the whole area of resilience, as I think about it, uh, and self repair is one way to address resilience to to improve resilience, is a fascinating one. It's it's not one that we have again paid attention too much when it comes to robotics. We usually think about a robot that needs to do a task and then a human will repair it if it's broken. But the idea of robots repairing themselves is, is fascinating. It's very interesting for many reasons, both uh, you know for practical reasons, but also to understand how that happens so well in, in biology. So when you look at biology, biology, biology biological nature, a biological system self-repair in many, many different ways in different scales. Uh, we have simple immediate self-repair like healing, right? Like bone mm -hmm. heals, skin heals. We also have regeneration, like some animals can regenerate a tail or, or a limb yeah. if, it's, if it, if it uh, gets uh, removed or uh, damaged. Uh, then we have uh, really the uh, adaptation at sort of the uh, brain or intelligence, if you like, the AI, where you say, okay, if, you, if a robot loses a leg, it can recover not by fixing the leg, but by walking differently. Mm. Uh, a plane that loses uh, uh, engine can recover 
not by fixing by the engine, but by adapting its control to compensate. So compensation is, is another way that we get self-repair. And finally, the ultimate form of self-repair is the ability to basically build a new machine. So we humans, we can only repair so much self-repair. At some point, we give birth to a new generation and that new generation uh, is again, uh, you know, carries the torch. So the ability to reproduce uh, yeah. is the ultimate form of self-repair. And that's really what allows systems to sustain. So the idea of robots building copies of themselves or self-reproducing robots, I think is the ultimate form of self-repair. Uh, and that's again, an area that hasn't been uh, explored much. So if you look at that, whole range of ways in which systems can maintain their resilience and, re and recover from damage, uh, we haven't even scratched the surface. It starts with materials and it ends with self-reproduction. Yeah, I think that's really excellent point. And maybe quick question here. Do you think maybe there's a certain optimum material from your expertise that we have to consider that case? materials yeah so yeah so so again the, the the whole question of materials in robotics is also a, a relatively uh novel exploration for a long time most robots were built with, with sort of rigid materials and aluminum and steel and plastic uh but uh now with the advent of soft robotics um as well as new manufacturing technology, in particular 3D printing, that allow us to really explore all kinds of novel materials and metamaterials. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the opportunity to greatly expand the range of materials that can be considered for soft robotics and for robotics in general. And so you know, we're seeing a lot of innovation in there. I know that in our lab, we've explored a lot of new materials. Uh, for example, we've explored these soft. Uh, actuation materials that you pass current through them and they expand and contract. Yeah. But there are many other labs, uh, you know, uh, Rebecca Kramer at Yale and uh, Rob Shepard at Cornell and, and Harvard and many other places that are exploring these fascinating meta materials that can be used both for actuation and for sensing and uh, transition the, their material properties over time in a controllable way. So, so the range of materials that you can embed when you're going into the soft robotic paradigm, again, is much larger than the traditional rigid robotics. And I think, again, it's one of these areas where we have not even uh, scratched the surface. Yeah, thanks a lot for mentioning that. Yeah. So maybe we can go for audience question. We have a lot of questions. So uh, the first question is in what domain will, will an uh, evolved robot finally be better in the real world design manually designed robots? Oh, that's that's uh, that's a fantastic question. I think uh, evolved robots, uh, you know, there's probably uh, right now different aspects of robots that can we can use design automation uh to outperform uh human uh design performance uh in, in practice right now it's areas like topology optimization and so mm -hmm. on at what point uh, will an entire robot uh uh evolved robot outperform a human design robot uh, i don't know that's uh that's uh you know a few decades away uh, probably uh, before that, before that happens. But I think eventually, um, you know, as we as the technology improves, more and more aspects of robots will be delegated to design automation, to yeah. the point where, um, you know, at this at this point, I would say almost every aspect of the the brain of the robot is better done using machine learning. Mm -hmm. than by direct programming. Uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to the physical body, we're still behind, uh, but already robotic parts that have been optimized automatically are probably better than the robotic parts that are designed manually. But the architecture of the robot is still the domain of uh, human uh, performance. Yeah, that's an excellent point, yeah. And second question here, we have uh, in GLOM project, robots evolve in simulation and then are printed. If we can print robot fast enough, will simulation still have utility? Yeah, I mean, simulation is, I think, the the only way to do this because uh, 
making robots in physical reality is too slow and expensive and uh, it's and wasteful and uh, and so on so you know being able to build better simulators be they uh, manually designed simulators like we we like titan and voxcad and so on or self-generated simulation as in self-aware machines simulation is the only way to go because simulation saves so much time energy cost mistakes risk any way you want to uh, uh, any way you want to look at it this is why i think uh you know humans have this am amazing advantage over other life forms because we have mastered the art of simulation we can mm. build simulators and we can simulate ourselves we can have imagination and that is an incredible advantage. So I think it's going to remain, the importance of simulation is going to uh, only increase. Also from a practical point of view, simulation tools and computing power is increasing exponentially, has been for more than a hundred years, isn't showing any signs of slowing down. Therefore our ability to simulate will only improve with time. And mm -hmm. therefore we can design more and more things in simulation. So, so I think uh, the importance of simulation is only going to grow. Yeah, yeah. And the question here, why should we evolve robots to do tasks that animals do so well? Shouldn't we just copy their bodies and focus on control? Yeah, that's a question I get frequently. That's, it's a good one. I think, um, well, f first of all, we want to do a lot of things that animals don't do. Mm. Uh, we want to, to fly from here to there very quickly and thin air. We want to go to space. We want to go... Uh, we want to uh, do a million things that animals don't do. So we can only copy animals so much, but at some point we need to be able to use ideas that are inspired from biology, but really apply them in new ways. And again, uh, mm -hmm. thinking outside that box is, is really uh, something that you can do in simulation and it's harder to do by just mm -hmm. copying uh, biology. But the other thing I want to emphasize is that our human imagination is limited. Uh, we, you know, it's very, even though we want to be able to think outside the box and come up with new ideas, it's hard, it's difficult. We humans cannot, it's very hard for us to think about, to, to be creative in areas where we don't have a lot of intuition. So we can have intuition about how to move with legs on the ground, but we have very little inf intuition about space travel or mm. about moving in deep uh, water or about flying or about, uh, you know, doing or by moving in nanoscale or microscale. Like we just don't have that kind of intuition because we haven't experienced those worlds. So in particular for those kinds of strange environments, the importance of a, simulating them, and B, using automated design techniques like evolution is going to be more and more important. And just copying nature is not going to be enough. Yeah, yeah. What are the potential benefits of robots that evolve and reproduce? And how do they both weight uh, the potential dangers? Yeah, so robots that evolve uh, and reproduce are almost like a nightmare scenario in many mm -hmm. sci-fi movies, right? So there's definitely pros and cons here. And uh, I don't want to diminish uh, the ethical questions around, uh, you know, about, around evolving robots. So I think, again, the advantages are, as I mentioned earlier, that, that we can, that robots will eventually be better in their performance than machines that are designed by humans. And we're already seeing that happen in artificial intelligence uh, and uh, capabilities of, of machine learning far exceed that of, of manually designed things. And I think the same thing uh, will happen to, to physical machines. Now, mm -hmm. should we do it? Are there dangers? Absolutely. I mean, this is a very powerful technology. If we master this and we are able to get to the point where robots can evolve and breed and improve themselves over time, um, you know, this uh, uh, is, uh, could potentially go in the wrong direction because we are losing control over where, what these robots do and, and we lose our ability to understand how they work. 
and how they operate because everything becomes a black box and so on. So again, that already is happening in artificial intelligence and yeah. it might also happen in engineering. That's a terrific question. Frankly, I don't have a simple answer for that. Yeah. I think uh, that's the, the arrow, the direction that technology is, is moving. And mm -hmm. we have to be, uh, you know, we have to have these discussions like we are having now so that everybody is involved in this and understand where it's going and, and can have a meaningful discussion about whether we should limit the technology in a particular way or whether how we should make sure that it is used for good uh, and not uh, applied in malicious ways. Uh, it doesn't go out of control. So I think these are, this is a good question and it's a discussion that we should keep having uh, yeah. as, as the technology involved. Right now, uh, design automation and, and, and evolution robotics is not at the point where it is so capable that it can go out of control, but artificial intelligence is. So I mm -hmm. think we are beginning to take these uh, discussions very seriously. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Also, I have a question here, Thay, that in absence of any reward, the intrinsic reward is self replication. You mentioned that. The question is uh, how you make sure this replication is going to be aligned with self awareness. Uh, or self-imaging and robot. Yeah. Well, so you know that's that's taking two very different topics and and sort of and, and combining them. So self-awareness is is one quest. Self-replication is another thing that we've seen uh, is is sort of what happens when you have no reward. Mm -hmm. Self-replication is this is a little bit of a a tricky and challenging point. Um, but when you place no reward, no explit, no external reward on a system, then self-replication is the only thing that uh, is the only intrinsic self-reward, uh, self, uh, the only intrinsic reward. And, and it happens because of the statistics, the pure statistics of uh, mathematical statistics. So if you put lots of molecules in a big vat and some molecules happen to be in a shape that induces more copies of themselves, yeah then uh, and other molecules are not good at creating copies of themselves then after a while there's going to be more copies of the self-replicating things than there are copies of the non-self-replicating things and it's not that the molecules want to self-replicate it's just by the virtue of the statistics the things that replicate end up dominating and mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that's why in a very statistical sense self-replication is equivalent to our re external reward. Uh, and so, uh, and the same thing we're seeing in simulation when we have robots uh, that are not rewarded for anything, then robots that can build copies of themselves by chance uh, just end up dominating the population. So we've seen that with self-replicating robots, we've seen it with self replicating neural networks. Uh, yeah, so self-replication is its own reward. And um, I forget the second part of your question, but it's yeah, definitely Yeah, it's it was about, there. yeah, the replication, how we make sure this aligned to be self-aware, maybe you yeah. use it to communicate it. Yeah. Right, so so it's, it's uh, not directly aligned with self-awareness. I mean, uh, if you look at biology, a lot of things self-replicate, but are not self-aware, right? So, you know, uh, bacteria, viruses, you name it, they all self-replicate, but they're not self-aware. So self-replication and self-awareness is not aligned at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the only things that self-replicate and are self-aware are humans. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, so it's definitely uh, not uh, a given. And uh, maybe it's not easy to align them. The only way they really align is in the sense that things that can self that are self-aware uh, are somewhat more resilient because they can simulate themselves into the future and they can control their own replication and improve it. And again, you see that with humans, uh, we humans, because we can anticipate things, because we can see ourselves into the future, we can do things like create medicine yeah. and uh, and improve our chances of, of uh, of creating viable offspring and, and protect ourselves and protect our children in ways that animals can't. And that improves self-replication, but that's a very, very sort of indirect connection. Yeah, great. 
And here's also a question, what is the most important open problem in AI? In, in what, in AI? Yes, yeah. Uh, okay, wow. There are many open questions in AI. My favorite one is again, self-awareness, uh, but I would say one of the emerging areas that has is increasingly important is how do we make sure that this technology benefits humanity rather than destroys humanity? And, and there's a lot, this mm -hmm. is a, AI is an incredibly powerful technology. Uh, we are seeing it evolve at incredible rates. Uh, if you've seen GPT-3, for example, language models are improving at incredible rates. Uh, we are discovering an incredible power, an incredible technology, and we have to make sure that it is used in a safe way that benefits everyone. Yeah. And yeah. that turns out to be a very difficult challenge because it's uh, it's it's such a powerful technology. So. I think that's a very practical uh, question that's before us, uh, mm -hmm. and we we need to make sure that we keep our eyes on it. And second part of the question: What new AI robotics technology are you excited about? So I'm, you know, uh, increasingly excited by by reinforcement learning, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you know, deep learning, of course, in general, and particular as it's applied to robotics, which is mostly through this idea of deep learning. Uh, and that is allowing robots to do things that were, again, traditionally uh, thought impossible. If you look at, for example, legged locomotion, uh, legged locomotion has been a, a, a very difficult challenge, uh, manipulation as well. It's one of these areas where researchers have uh, worked for decades trying to get a robot to do simple things like uh, manipulate an object or walk on two legs. And it's been incredibly difficult. The, the examples are very rare of robots that can walk on two legs in a, in a stable and resilient way or can manipulate an object as gracefully as a human can. But if you look at most of the accomplishments that have happened in the last few years, and most of them have been driven by, by AI technology and reinforcement learning and deep learning. So deep learning in general is revolutionizing robotics. And uh, I think uh, I think it's gonna, we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, yeah. And also there's a question, why don't we have useful autonomous robots in real world yet? Um, that's a terrific question. I think autonomous robots for the most part have been useful only in factories in large part because we had the problem of perceptions so mm -hmm. robots could not perceive the world in any deep way like humans can and animals uh, the, in other words robots were blind they couldn't see and therefore they can only work in structured environments where they're very protected and they do the same thing now in the last, I'd say, decade or maybe half a decade, due to deep learning, robots can finally see. They can understand what they're seeing. They can understand how their body works. Uh, they can learn to walk. They can learn to manipulate. All these things that for many decades eluded us are now possible. And this is why we're suddenly seeing things like driverless cars, yeah. Uh, drones that can understand uh, their environment and uh, and autonomous robots are finally making it out of the factory into the real world. So mm -hmm. I think uh, we are already seeing, for example, driverless cars in my in my mind are going to be the first uh, autonomous robot that most people will interact with on a daily basis and not only interact with, but also uh, uh, basically trust their lives to and their lives of the children to yeah. uh, and we'll do that on a daily basis and that's just around the corner and the same thing with drones uh, and uh, autonomous aircraft so this is already happening and again our, our our children will will not even notice it because it's going to be so ubiquitous yeah yeah that's great so also we have still three questions from the audience uh, how what advice would you give to a robotist before uh, they interview for an assistant professorship? And what advice would you give to first year uh, robotics PG student looking for a thesis topic? Oh, okay, that, that's a really <laughs> good question. I think, well, first, the good news is that um, 
uh, I think this area of robotics and AI is growing and exploding, and I'm not aware of a single university uh, that is not interested in hiring in this area. Uh, similarly, if you look at tech companies, all the growth or a lot of the growth is in this area of AI and robotics. So, so everybody's scrambling. So it doesn't matter if you're looking for a job or you're looking for a faculty position, there is a lot of growth in this area and a lot of potential and a lot of need. I can speak uh, for Columbia, you know, we're always looking to hire in this area, uh, Columbia University, but also uh, I can say if I look at the size of our graduate program, the fastest growing area is robotics and artificial intelligence. And so, mm -hmm. so I think that's the good news, uh, but it's also becoming more competitive. Uh, there's more and more people in this area. There's more, a lot more industry activity uh, area. There's a lot more talent that's coming into this area. Uh, and so the bar is rising. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's it's uh, you know that's that's good overall. But as an individual, it just means that you have to really look to innovate uh, in ways that differentiate yourself from other people. Uh, mm -hmm. My advice would be, um, you know, it really depends of what angle you're coming in from. But if you're a mechanical engineer going into robotics, you need to understand AI and the uh, so the software programming. I've seen too many engineers come in thinking that, you know, programming is, not, is for the computer scientists and they're just gonna focus on the mechanical engineering. But the computer science, the AI, the machine learning is part and parcel of, of robotics. And the same thing I would say for those that are coming in from the computer science side who think they're only gonna focus on the AI but really, uh, you know, building physical robots is just something for an engineer to do, and it's, it's it's sort of an afterthought. The reality is to have any kind of impact in robotics field, you also have to build physical things, not just simulate them. So I think my the message here here is that robotics is an interdisciplinary field, and when you're looking to search for new topics and new impact, and uh, to differentiate yourself, you really have to understand. Uh, both aspects, both the, the body and the brain, if you like. Yeah. And that's where that intersection is where a lot of the innovation is going to happen. Yeah, that's really good advice. And also for, for the second part for BT student, I don't know if you can answer what advice we'd give first year robotics BT student looking for a thesis topic. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's something I struggle with on a daily basis, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to say. Um, what I tell my PhD students is, and different different faculty do this in different way, but I say you have to uh, start, you know, my PhD students, when they begin their PhD, they don't know what their topic is. Uh, and it's a journey. You start and they, they try three, four different things and eventually something gels. And the other thing, and this might sound strange is, uh, strange, and it's, it's, it's not something that necessarily most faculty yeah. would agree with, but I, I believe that you should not read too much about what other people are doing. Do not mm -hmm. read too many papers about what's out there. Just think big, think about what we call a moonshot, about this mm -hmm. crazy idea and start working on it and don't worry too much about uh, about what other people have done and what's possible. Because if you read too many papers and you do too much literature review, inev invariably you're gonna end up being incremental. So if you really want to do breakthroughs and do big things, you have to be a little bit out there thinking big, a little bit delusional even about what's possible and go for this grand thing. And only after you've worked on it for a while, you can go back and see what other people have done, but you got to start by thinking big and don't be afraid to try and fail a couple of different projects before you find your topic. My students will certainly cycle through three or four different topics before they settle yeah. on their big idea. I really like this point so much. I think even the podcast discuss how we can maybe if you have new ideas, and as you mentioned, the, um, the comparison between being incremental and outside to have a breakthrough. And sometimes, I don't know if you agree in academia, sometimes we 
I don't know, maybe yeah, I don't figure it out, but there's a tendency to be less risky and make sure you have enough results that you can get this publication and also secure funding. Because if you go to risk ideas and you didn't get any result, of course, uh, there are exceptions yeah. here. Like you and other guests have really revolutionary idea in the field. And this is something not everyone can do. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. that's why there's a tendency to be less risky and do what could be right, like right. incrementally. Yeah. Look, look, academia is very conservative. Uh, and it's particularly conservative when it comes to reviewing papers and reviewing uh, grants and so on. And it's true. Uh, that when you come to risky, bold ideas, it's harder to innovate. Uh, it's harder to evaluate progress and to know yes. what to do. And this is why, why uh, let's say, grant, uh, grant proposals and so forth tend to be more incremental because they're easier to, to review and easier to, to mm -hmm. compare. Uh, it's true. Um, this is where, um, this is, where, so look, for, for maybe the, the you know, for academia, however, has the most, the broadest license to do non-incremental stuff. The companies uh, have, you know, financial constraints to make them do incremental things and make them look at the next quarter. Academia has this very, uh, very uh, progressive and uh, an unusual license to do moonshots hmm. and, uh, it's scary to do these big ideas, but I think uh, I think it's very important because you know if academia does not do big things, who's going to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, so so I agree. Academ academics tend to be conservative, uh, but I think one has to to uh, uh, fight that uh, urge to be conservative and to do the big things. And if your faculty, it's a little bit different because you can mitigate, you can hedge your bets by doing some risky things and some incremental things. And there are, you're always mm -hmm. gonna have something. But if you're a graduate student, you are limited to what you can do because you can only work on one or two things at a time. And then it's a little bit, um, a little bit uh, more of, a, mm -hmm. more of a, a challenge. But uh, again, the, I think those that uh, really um, make it in a big way in academia are those that take the big risks. And so it's a balance, it's a personal trait and some people are more comfortable with, with doing uh, big things and some people are more comfortable doing incremental and that's, uh, that's okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, do you think that maybe at least having hybrid could be? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you know, if you can, if you, if you can do two projects and one of them is incremental and one of them is, is risky, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. In general, being able to do more than one project at a time has always proven uh, useful, both for me as a faculty and for students uh, and PhD students. Uh, if you can do multiple projects at a time, you hedge your bets, you can do risky and conservative at the same time. Also, if you're doing, uh, there's always a chance that a project might not work. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a good thing to do if you can manage that. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. I also have uh, another question here. Uh, how do you approach the ethical dilemma of military funding scientific research? I don't know if you can ask this question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a good question. Uh, you know, in general, I find so we, we've had in our group funding from everywhere from mm -hmm. military like DARPA, but we've also had NIH funding uh, and uh, funding from uh, NSF and lots of different eras, I would say my experience has been that all of the fundings end up being very, very similar. So even when you do, uh, when you get funding from, from a defense like DARPA, yeah. the kind of topics that we work on uh, in these defense are, first of all, they're all, all published completely. So we, we, you know, our university will not even accept funding for, for uh, anything that cannot be published. So all the, all the research is published openly. And um, and the kind of topics that we that we get funded for military funding is no different in any way from topics that get funding through NSF or NIH. Mm -hmm. So it really uh, boils down to what topics you work on. And and uh, the other angle that I want to bring up is that most of the technologies that we work on are uh, dual use. So when you're working on AI and robotics, even if it's funded by National Science Foundation, the robot that you're developing could be used for military application. 
So just because it's not funded by military doesn't mean it cannot be used by military. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, uh, militaries across the planet use technologies that were developed under non-military funding. So this idea that military funding leads to military technology and non-military funding is somehow more ethical, I think is, is, is misleading because the reality is that any technology can be used for anything. So, it, so whatever funding you use, you have one has the the responsibility to make sure that it's used in in good ways and and to mm -hmm. avoid uh, nefarious uses and that's regardless of the source of funding. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I will. We will close that. I will take two questions from the audience here and then we close for uh, last two questions. Uh, the first question is, is: Deep learning a fate, or it will be ha have a significance in a decade? And what about five decades? Uh, deep learning is not a, fa uh, uh, a fad, uh, it is going to stay, stay here forever and it's going to keep improving uh, in a decade and five decades. I think what we're seeing is uh, if you look at all the results that have all the breakthroughs in AI and many in robotics like locomotion and ventilation, they're all being achieved using deep learning, all of them. Yeah. Uh, almost, it's, it's there has been no other technology that has a uh, a sequence of uh, breakthroughs that is uh, is so dramatic as uh, deep learning. So I think it is on par with other technologies like uh, steam engine, power, electricity, fire, all these different technologies that have changed uh, the course of human civilization, uh, and we've never looked back. And and this is. Uh, one of those. So it's going to be here. It's going to keep on giving. Yeah. And if you look at the exponential growth of these kinds of technologies, growth in data, growth in computing power, growth in the size of deep learning model, they're all growing exponentially and have been growing for at least a decade. So I think they are, they're going to continue. And this is why uh, it's uh, so important to understand them. And so important to understand, uh, again, the ethics around their application because they're not going to go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And last question from the audience. What is your uh, favorite popular science book? Oh, that's a, that's a really hard one. That's a really hard question. Um, probably, um, well, I have some, some, some ones that I don't like <laughs> that rub me the wrong way, but... but uh, um, you know, I have to say that uh, uh, one of the things that I, one of the uh, books that I enjoy the most is uh, Sun. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an Asimov uh, book that talks about how uh, different civilizations develop in different ways, depending on how their structure, how their uh, environment uh, develops and how they uh what they can learn from their environment so that was for me a very illuminating book mm -hmm. wonderful yeah and do you have any crazy ideas of something you aspire in your research crazy ideas something you, you think about it oh be, uh, be more crazy than self-awareness okay that's a <laughs> i would say self-awareness already a lot of people think i'm yeah. crazy for that crazy, yeah. uh, so even crazier than that um you know one thing that i, I can tell you about my pet project Mm -hmm. um, so I have a, uh, uh, in, in our living room, uh, we have a, uh, painting robot that paints oil on yeah. canvas. Uh, it's called PIX18 and you can, you can see it online on PIX18.com. And this is, it paints oil on canvas and it's learning to paint. And this is already the fourth generation of that robot. Uh, and my goal there is to create, to have a machine that will have, a robot that will have its own experiences around the world and it will paint its own art and create uh, painting based on sensations that we humans do not have uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that to me is the ultimate thing when you know i i we we you know you mentioned that in the beginning of the interview that as a child uh, one of my big aspirations was to meet an alien species and I read books about uh, Bermuda Triangle and all kinds of yeah. things hoping that one day I'll meet an alien <laughs> today I know that I probably will not meet an alien but I will meet uh, another intelligent species 
Mm, what kind of That's, discussion do you imagine with the alien? Is yeah, so, of- so I, I, you know, I didn't get that far. I, it was always based on movies like, uh, like uh, you know, uh, meeting with uh, a, a third encounter, uh, third species, and so uh, third kind, and so yeah. on. I always wonder what it's going to be like, and that's another kind of uh, book or, or movie that that inspired me. Mm-hmm. And now I know that I will meet a new species, and that's going to be an AI, a robotic species, and that's mm-hmm. going to happen in our lifetime. It's happening right now, and I always wonder what was going to be their art and what is going to be their poetry. Uh, mm-hmm. When an alien species can see the world in colors we can't see and hear the world in frequencies we cannot hear and go places we cannot go. And yeah. that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build that robot that can go places I can't go and can paint art that I cannot imagine. And we'll yeah. see what happens. So maybe that's yeah. crazy enough. Yeah, this is a crazy and beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since you have these crazy ideas, uh, do you think it was important for you when you have to? convince the world it because sometimes it's, it's not easy to grasp what you what you're trying to do at early in 2007 right. for example so it's a time the ego is important for you that ego to to convince to to ego, convince a- yeah yeah do you think ego is important that when you in, in as a researcher do you think you, the ego is important for right. you right i think i think look it, it is important in the sense that academia uh is uh, frequently long term, uh, you do things and you don't get an immediate reward. It's not like you you design yeah. something and you sell it and people buy it, or you are a doctor and you cure somebody and they walk away and they are cured and you get that immediate reward or at least short term. Academia is often you're working on things and you're alone and mm-hmm. you're sort of uh, sailing west. Uh, in a way, you know, you you know you want to get something, but you're not sure there's something on the other side. And the only thing that can hold you during those dark times where you're alone working on something mm-hmm. is is uh, a combination of ego that you believe really that getting there, there is going to be amazing things. And you're curious. It's curiosity. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's your colleagues around you that are also on a similar journey. It's your students that are also going on a similar journey and and that camaraderie of people that are exploring and going somewhere else is very important so that's where i think the ego comes in and that that and also that community of other researchers that is very very important for academia uh, and and uh, sometimes uh, there's a lot of adversity people will tell you again mm-hmm. we, we talked about this incremental thinking that because you're not solving a problem that's that's uh, appreciated, then maybe you're wasting time. On the other hand, uh, you know, if you if you mm-hmm. balance different kind of projects, uh, you can in some of them you can go far, and some yeah. of them you can get immediate reward, and that will keeps you keeps you going. And I think that again in academia, teaching serves that immediate goal. So yeah. when you teach, you get that more immediate reward. You teach someone and they walk out of your class and you've inspired them or they, they learned a new topic and you get that immediate reward. And that is enough to feed you while you're going on that long-term journey that's uh, where, you're, where you're mostly yeah. alone. Yeah, just a quick question here because I think you brought a very excellent point. When you were a junior researcher uh, since uh, like uh, when you started these ideas, it was you feel like the community accepting you, or you felt like a pariah at the beginning. Was you still young research and had this bold ideas and crazy idea? How you feel there? Do you think you have to work with people just to understand you, or maybe it was a challenging because many junior faculty and others, or maybe students, yeah. it's hard to, if you're still a student. How how on earth you can propose such crazy right. ideas? Like you know. The answer is that, that it, we have this formula in our lab that, we, that uh, we, we keep going back to, that your impact is a product of two things. It's the yeah. quality of your research multiplied by the quality of your communication. Yeah. In other words, if you do a high quality research, but you cannot communicate it and inspire other people, then yeah. nobody will know about your research and you might as well not have done that research because it's going to die and nobody's going to read the paper and nobody's going to know about it. And if you're good at communication, but you have low quality of research, then it's also not good. You can communicate about stuff, but it's not high quality. So the only way to have impact is to do both, to do good research and 
to communicate it well. And you almost have to put the same level of effort on both of these sides. And a lot of people in academia put a lot of effort on quality, but not enough on communication. And so mm -hmm. their work remains obscure and uh, unrecognized. Uh, so we put a lot of emphasis in our lab, not just about doing good work, but also how do you communicate it? How do you write a good paper? How do you make a video of it? How do you talk about it? How do you speak about your research in a passionate way that people will understand why you're excited? And I, and, and I believe that during my early years as a faculty member, I somehow, I learned this from, from my advisors who are also good at that, at that. And at the time, people in academia sort of almost ridicule that okay oh you're you know if you're engaged in media that's not a good thing but the reality is that you have to engage in communication also to convince your colleagues that what you're doing is good you have to engage in good communication in order to to have other people read your papers and, and watch your videos and and understand why the topic you're working on is actually important and when you can do both of these things you can really take off so uh, i think there's more aware awareness of this today People mm -hmm. in academia today understand that communication is important. Uh, and yes, when you are beginning your career, you have to spend, I'd say, half of your time communicating your research, going to conferences, going online, making videos, blogs, tweeting, whatever it is. And, and mm -hmm. it changes all the time. But whatever it is, you have to make sure that you communicate what you're doing, why it's important, why it's exciting. And, and then you can get people on board. I think this is really wonderful advice about communication. Yeah. And uh, maybe here, what's maybe the most important quality? One important quality you think is very crucial for you while being in academia. You have gained and you have to maintain as well in your academic journey. Uh, yeah, I think I think it is, it is, is uh, this ability to be comfortable with uncomfortable research topics. Mm. All right, so this is this is with these uncomfortable journeys, because when you are doing things that are uncharted areas, I mean, the only way to make a, a breakthrough is to go somewhere where no one has been before. That's almost by definition. And when you go somewhere where nobody's been before, you're going to be uncomfortable uh, for many reasons. There's not going to be tools and there's not going to be metrics. Uh, your papers are not going to be evaluated. Uh, systematically, you're going to get a lot of rejections. People are going to question you about the risk that you're taking. So you got to be uncomfortable, comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think that's the most important quality. And sometimes it involves being delusional or less realistic. Um, the way I like to phrase it is if you think about, uh, if you imagine yourself, you know, having um, an option to do something that's, you know, high, high risk, high reward, and it has 90% mm -hmm. chance of failing. Uh, would you do that? So, uh, uh, you know, a reasonable person would say, no, I'm not going to do something that has 90% chance of failing. On the other hand, if you do 10 things that are each of them 90% chance of failing, then overall, there's better chance than not that at least one of them will succeed. And so you have to get into that statistical frame of mind where you're doing lots of crazy things and one of them is gonna work out. And mm -hmm. that's called being comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's and, true, yeah. and, and most people want to make that decision in advance. What should I choose? I'm gonna guarantee a success. And you can't do that. You have to do multiple things and take a chance. But if you do multiple things in parallel, then you increase your odds that one of these things will succeed and you will have done the impossible, which is to, um, yeah. you know, to do something that's uh, low odds. And later you can tell a story how clever you were uh, 